Hey, Vinyl community. So I wanted to do an episode devoted to Tears for Fears. I'm going to be showing my CD collection. Tears for Fears just came out with their seventh studio album just a few weeks ago, The Tipping Point. So I want to do a bit of a review on that album, but also show the other CDs that I have as part of my Tears for Fears collection. I'm going to start off with their debut album. This is The Hurting. This is an early synth pop album. I think this was released in 82 uh, or 83, if I'm not mistaken. Um, very much uh, synth pop, very keyboard oriented drum machines, but it is head and shoulders above a lot of other synth pop debuts. Bands like Soft Cell or Depeche Mode or New Order. This album is a strong, strong debut. And it's better than really it has any right to be, uh, considering this was their first album. It's got some goth elements of it that remind me a little bit of Susie and the Banshees. But the hit off of here was Change. I don't know if you could really call it a hit. It wasn't like it was in the top 10 or anything like that. But uh, it was on MTV, got a lot of uh, rotation on MTV. Um, the song Pale Shelter, I've heard on um, alternative rock stations. But just a really great, solid album. And it doesn't sound like anything else that Tears for Fears uh, has put out. Sort of like they were feeling their way. This is who they were at the time. Uh, trying to be kind of that early 80s. Uh, kind of jumping on that uh, new wave. Um, you know, the second British invasion with Duran Duran and Flock of Seagulls and bands like that. Uh, but just a really great, solid album. Their next album uh, came out in 1985, and that seemed like forever back in the day because usually bands were putting out one album a year, and Tears for Fears took their time with this album, and it definitely paid off. This sounds so stylistically different from the first album. You'd almost be, uh, you know, it's understandable if you would confuse this as the work of an entirely different band. It is one of my favorite albums of the 1980s, Songs from the Big Chair. The huge hits off here where everybody wants to rule the world and head over heels, one of my favorite songs of the 1980s. But you've also got Shout. Uh, you've got really texturally, uh, I guess, mature and sophisticated tracks like The Working Hour, um, Listen, I believe, but just such a range of styles on here. Mother's Talk was another single off here, uh, but this was huge when it came out. Still one of the greatest albums of all time, in my opinion, um, but nonetheless, my favorite Tears for Fears album still to this day. And then in, I think it was 1989, they came out with their third album, um, The Seeds of Love. As you can tell by the cover, got some psychedelic influences on here. The uh, track Sowing the Seeds of Love was a big radio hit on MTV. And it's got a, definitely a Beatles influence. But you got some, again, moving I, almost in an adult contemporary kind of direction with Bad Man Song. Uh, advice for the young at heart. Um, Swords and Knives on here is such a fantastic, atmospheric, moody track. I love it. It is one of those songs that when you're driving at night, put it on when it's a, you know, a sky full of stars. It is the perfect track to listen to and just chill out to. I love that track to death. One of my favorite Tears for Fear songs. And another solid album. This would be the last album uh, where you had uh, Kurt Smith. Um, he would leave after this album. I think he just felt there were some artistic differences and his input wasn't being uh, as represented as Roland Orzabal's. Uh, but still a solid way. It was sort of, you know, like the end of an era for Tears for Fears. Even though they'd been around since the early 80s, they only put out three albums, but all of the albums were high, high quality. And then they came out with the greatest hits. This was Tears for Fears, Tears Roll Down. Um, the only track that was not previously on a Tears for Fears album was the track Laid So Low, uh, Tears Roll Down, which I love. 
Uh, Roland Orzabal put this compilation together, and he's the only one who plays on Laid So Low, but I love that track. Uh, great hits compilation here. You've got all the best stuff from their first three albums, and it's a great sampler. Even today, if you're looking to get into Tears for Fears and you can find this, pick it up. It is solid. Then Roland Orzabal continued on with Tears for Fears, sort of like, I mean, he was really the only member, kind of like uh, Trent Reznor, truly the only member of Nine Inch Nails, but came out with this album, Elemental, in the early 90s, in the middle of the whole grunge um, scene that was going on. Um, Break It Down Again was a single that was on alternative radio at the time. This one's good. I mean, it is... For all intents and purposes, it's a Roland Orzabal solo album, but very solid, enjoyable album. Not to the quality of the first three Tears for Fears albums, but, you know, I enjoy this album quite a bit. It's a good listen, and it's early 90s alternative. And then the next uh, uh, Roland Orzabal solo album, if you will, under the Tears for Fears moniker is Raul. And the Kings of Spain. This album is fantastic. This album is way better than Elemental, at least in my opinion. And I think it holds up great with the first three Tears for Fears album. It's melodic pop on here. It rocks hard in places. All the songs are memorable. That's a thing, you know, what you run into sometimes with bands who are getting deeper into their career. The songs start sounding the same. There's nothing memorable. It's just kind of blah. This is not the case. This is an underrated album. I've loved this since the day I bought it. I think I got it with BMG like a record club or something like that, because I saw, ooh, Tears for Fears has a new album. Was not disappointed. Great, great album. Definitely check it out if you love Tears for Fears. And then they did, re uh, there was a reunite, uh, reunion, sorry, a reunion with Kurt Smith and Roland Orzabal uh, with the album Everybody Loves a Happy Ending, I think was the title of that CD. I do not have it. Heard it a little bit. It wasn't blown away. Um, would like to eventually pick it up on CD one day. So that brings us to their latest album, The Tipping Point. Now, when I first heard this, I listened to it on Spotify because I was debating like, uh, do I want to buy it? Yeah, I hate laying down money for a disc or a record and then you bring it home, you put it on and it totally sucks. And you're like, uh, not only do I hate this album, but now it's taking up space in my collection. What am I going to do? Now I got to, do I want to sell it? Uh, I just didn't want to have to go through all that. And so heard it on Spotify for the first time. And I'm like, hmm. yeah, like the first three tracks I thought were great. And then at least on first listen, it was kind of like, uh, went downhill a little bit. I started to lose interest as the album went on. And then I gave it a second listen. And I have to tell you, I think this is a fantastic record. It is exactly the kind of modern Tears for Fears album that you would hope it would be. Uh, and it's interesting because it starts off with No Small Thing, which it has an acoustic opening, which for Tears for Fears, like, wait a minute. And then it kicks in and it's a very on Tears for Fears like song. I mean, the mel it's very melodic and the lyrics are interesting and it's sung well, it's performed well, but it was just like, oh, Okay, that took a little bit of an adjustment too, like the song. And then the second song, which is the title track, The Tipping Point, totally Tears for Fears, exactly, you know, the template of every previous uh, Tears for Fears big hit going back to Everybody Wants to Rule the World. Love it. Just a great, great epic track. Um, long, long... Sorry, trying to read it, it's a little dark. Uh, long, Long, Long Time is another sort of a little melancholy kind of ballad, which is great. Uh, but, you know, going through, because if you haven't heard it, I'm not going to go track by track. But definitely, first listen, I was like, um, it's okay. Second listen, I'm like, this album is freaking great. So, I love it. 
And it's the songs stick with you. It's like I heard them that second time. I'm like, oh, the melodies took hold. Yes, I remember that. And now it sounds way better than I remember it the first time. So, yeah, definitely check this out if you're a Tears for Fears fan. You won't be disappointed. Some of the production is a, a bit modern. You know, and some of these I was listening to thinking, ah, oh, this kind of reminds me a little bit of Panic of the Disco or something a little bit more modern. But, you know, you're not, Tears for Fears is not going to be uh, performing and, you know, using the production style that they did back in the early 80s. It's a contemporary album. So, the sounds matured a little bit, but I do enjoy it quite a bit. Are their voices spectacular? No. Are they weak? No, they're not weak either. It's just, I, I think, again, as you age, your voice takes on a different resonance and timber and all of that, but it's still very much a familiar Tears for Fears record, and I think it is great. If I had to rank it uh, in terms of their catalog, I'd probably, honestly be like number three or four now. And that's not slagging it, it's just I love, I mean, I would probably go with songs from the big chair, the debut, and then Raul and the Kings of Spain, and then this record. Uh, it's just got too much competition to put it any higher, but still very enjoyable. I'm so glad I did buy this. I'm probably gonna get it on vinyl at some point. But anyway, that's my take. Uh, if you've heard it, let me know what you think. And have a great day.